All right, so this is part two of unit two, where we talk about the solid phase. Now remember, the only VCCS requirement for this section is to classify solids based on type. Um, and so really, um, it gets very specific in your reading. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. So when we talk about solids, we typically talk or think in terms of crystallization or closely packed particles. Now, best examples usually are something like ionic solids or metallic solids. Ionic solids, you have um, cations and anions um, directly next to one another. Um, metals, you actually have, actually this is probably copper, huh, um, based off color. You have uh, ionic, cat cationic metal ions um, directly next to one another. The thing that holds these together is not the electrostatic interactions between oppositely charged particles, but rather the fact that these cations over here are sharing electrons in a mobile, uh, delocalized way. And so you end up getting just as stable of a solid crystal that way. Now, in addition to ionic and metallic solids, you can also have covalent solids. Now, these could be um, molecules like you see here, where you have diamond, which is just carbon that has been arranged in a very specific orientation. Or you could have graphite, which is carbon bonded in another arrangement. You could also have silicon dioxide, which is um, uh, glass, and silicon uh, carbide, or any other series of molecules that are oriented in this way. So in addition to, so guys, if you look, ionic metallic solids, covalent network solids, now we're going to molecular solids. Carbon dioxide, those molecules sitting next to each other, not bonded to one another like a network, but sitting next to each other uh, make molecular solids. Um, this is just dry ice, and so those molecules will sit next to each other uh, and interact pretty weakly, which is why dry ice will um, sublime right in front of you. I think you can still get it at the store. I think uh, Harris Teeter sells it. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw it at Farm Fresh, but it's been a few years since I've looked for it. Um, but you can watch it sublime. It makes really nice Halloween decorations um, or party decorations, I'll say that. Um, and it's really cheap. So here are your four types of solids. Um, for the most part, guys, what I want you to know about these is if I say, oh, um, a network of silicon dioxide is what type of solid, you should be able to tell me, oh, it's a covalent network. If it's, if I give you the formula and say, what kind of solid is iron, you should be able to tell me that it's metallic. You have a salt crystal, it should be this. Um, sugar crystals should be molecular. But more importantly, guys, um, you need to know the properties. And um, you really get this from your reading. I could read this to you, but I don't want to get but so detailed. Okay, Emma, hold on. Um... I don't want to get too detailed by reading this because I think you can, but I do want to just point out things like salt. A salt crystal, if you were to hammer it, would break apart. It is brittle. Um, and just like all other ions, it would conduct electricity um, if you dissolve it in water or have it in liquid phase. On the other hand, if you're holding a salt crystal, it's not going to do much to increase a shock for you. Um, same thing for uh, things like diamond. We know that that's hard, not conductive, 
and it better not melt or you will have paid a lot of money for no reason. And so these covalent network solids have properties here. If I were you, I would probably turn this into a series of flashcards for your exam. But it is up to um, you as individual students for that. Now, we can also talk about either <coughs> what, what your book calls uh, crystal defects. You have molecules that are replaced or within a crystalline structure. And so, for example, here you've got an interstitial impurity where this is present within the holes of the molecule that are there. Uh, molecules or atoms that are there. Um, for example, if you had a bunch of iron atoms with the occasional carbon in these holes, um, you end up getting steel. That carbon impurity helps make it uh, both stronger and more resistant to oxidation or rusting. Substitutional impurities, when you replace one of these for something else, something like copper, originally like this, and then instead of having all copper the way you intended, maybe um, replacing some of them with zinc. This substitutional alloy um, would be brass and is also going to have properties that are a little different from the original uh, solid. Um, brass is harder than copper metal. It is also going to be um, a little more resistant to different reactions. Now the big thing with um, alloys is they are incredibly useful, especially for engineering students. But on the other hand, um, we don't really talk about them this semester because it's not part of the VCCS requirements. And I don't want to overload you too much. However, we can talk a little bit about how solids are oriented in three-dimensional space. For the most part, you are going to have lattice structures. These are going to be the unit cell of metals. Um, it is the simplest way to have a repeating crystal. And so here you just have a unit cell that is one on top of the other. You could continue this in any line forever. Um, I just kind of want to show you what that means. <coughs> in general, anytime you have a simple lattice like this, it's going to have one on top and above and below, one to the left and to the right, and then in front and below, behind. Just like three axes on a graph, this is going to have uh, six pieces all the way around it. So this is just called a simple cubic lattice. It's the same one we've been looking at. and has eight corners overall. Um, you can kind of see it in the back there. All eight corners are shared by eight other blocks. So you have one in front here, uh, one to the left back there, one to the left right here, and then all four will also have something on the top. And so each corner contains one-eighth of each molecule, but there's eight corners. So eight times one-eighth gives us overall one at atom in that lattice structure. Meanwhile, um, you can actually take this simple lattice and expand it into a body-centered cubic where in between these points, there's one directly in the middle. So here you have 8 times 1 eighth on the corners, plus the one in the middle. 1 plus 1 gives you two atoms here. 
For the face-centered cubes, each of these is going to be shared by half. You have one, six sides of a dice, so six times one half gives you three, plus eight times one eighth of the corners is one. Overall, this guy has four atoms in a simple cube or a simple lattice. So this is what the body-centered cubic structure looks like. Um, this is really hard to see for some students, so just be aware that if that is the case, read through your text, ask questions, um, and I'm trying not to get um, too detailed by giving you examples of which thing does what. Face-centered cube looks more like this. Same thing. If you're having a hard time seeing that these sides are one half used by each cube or each lattice, um, just try to go through your reading, try to memorize what it says, and um, it gets easier starting in Unit 3 because of the math. Now your text goes into a lot of detail about repeating. And so we can talk about the fact that a minute ago we had simple lattices where it was like one on top of the other. Most of the time what's going to happen is similar to when you're stacking eggs or other things. It's going to sit in these holes that are created. Um, <coughs> and so they call it ABC or ABA, uh, depending on the orientation. It's a little more detailed than what we need, but I kind of wanted to show you what that meant. Same thing here, it's just a different view. Now it also talks about octahedral versus tetrahedral holes in ionic compounds or ionic solids. And here it's because you're either going to be touching four or you're going to be touching six, oh, sorry, four or six um, atoms or ions. And so you can kind of account for different ions by looking for um, where you can put your positives and your negatives to make sure that it is uh, uh, detailed enough. Now, I will tell you guys, they go into the, to the de Bragg equation. You do not need that. We do not need to look at the size of a solid. We do not need to look at how to calculate that because it is not a requirement of the VCCS. So if you can just kind of see the simple cube, the body-centered, the face-centered cube, and identify the types of solids, keep... based off these properties, I'm pretty content with that. I just don't want you to have too much of a question um, about what your reading is talking about. So again, if you had a similar size cation and anion, thinking back to Unit 7 and 111, that would be something like cesium and chlorine. Um, you could have a nice uh, body-centered cube where everything would fit in the holes that are created, no problem. On the other hand, if you have very different, um, it's going to look a little bit more like that, where your anions um, or your cations are going to be uh, spread out a little bit more than uh, you would otherwise have. Um, but the idea is still the same. Um, so that really ends this for our Unit 2. Um, hopefully that helps clarify some of the questions that are generated by your text and um, helps. Make sure you're looking over your homework for good example questions.